We continue studying the book of Esther, so turn to chapter 3 this morning. And as you turn there, I want to thank uh, one member or family or couple for, uh, you may remember the nursery list that we had in the bulletin last week, a long list of items that were needed. And, and uh, one of our members, he, she, they, uh, purchased all of those for us. And uh, I don't know if they want to be anonymous, so I'll play it safe. But I do want to say thank you very much. And I love that because I think generosity breeds generosity. And it's a good thing for us to learn to be generous. What do we have that we have not received, as the Bible says elsewhere? Well, we today, if today's your first day with us, we're studying this seemingly irrelevant book uh, uh, by the name of Esther, which uh, I trust we'll find a great deal of relevance in it as we move through these chapters. This was occurring during the days of the Persian Empire, and uh, the Jews were scattered <clears throat> throughout that empire, having been carried into exile more than 70 years earlier by the Babylonians. And since that time, uh, when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, they allowed the Jews to return home. Many did, but many did not. After all, they'd been in Persia for more than 70 years, and it was home. And uh, the Persian Empire was known for its general tolerance of ethnic minorities, and so many stayed. Unfortunately, uh, things can change in a hurry, and the empire was about to turn very, very nasty. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We rejoice that it never returns void, but accomplishes what you please, just as the rain and snow come down from heaven and water the earth and cause it to bring forth and bud. So may your word and its great relevance for us speak to our hearts today and in the coming weeks that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, that we would learn not to misread the signs, that we would learn to trust you, that we would learn to get off the throne ourselves, and that we would learn that you never slumber nor sleep, but always accomplish your purposes according to the counsel of your own will. So bless our time together this morning through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Esther 3, after these things, King Ahasuerus, who was also Xerxes, by the way, I'll use the name Xerxes more than Ahasuerus, because Xerxes was his Greek name and it's easier to pronounce. But after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gates said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month, till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people, scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. 
Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, by this time in the narrative, maybe a quick review is in order. Esther had become queen. Esther, otherwise uh, an obscure Jewish orphan living somewhere in the Persian Empire, had been chosen, amazingly, uh, to replace Queen Vashti, who had, to her credit, stubbornly Uh, refused to be objectified by the king. That was a good thing that Vashti did, but it cost her her role, her place as queen. And thus uh, an international beauty pageant was uh, held, and in something of a Cinderella story, Esther was chosen. The great historian Josephus tells us there were about 50 million people scattered throughout the Persian Empire. And the search was underway for the one who would be chosen to be queen. And out of the 50 million, or let's say half, or maybe a little less than half, 400 beautiful young virgins made the cut after all the vetting. And they were brought to the king's palace for a very intensive 12-month period of beauty treatments and uh, perhaps training in uh, court etiquette. Now, some of you know that that our youngest son was married eight days ago, and uh, I took mental note of some of the preparations that were made, particularly on the part of the women, and I noted that a few days before the big event that uh, the bridesmaids and the mothers went and had their pedicures and their manicures. And then the big day came and uh, they went off to some place to have their hair done professionally and have the makeup and be all dolled up and beautiful. That's the idea, right? Right? What happens when it doesn't work? (laughs) Some of them said, uh, we look orange. And they washed the makeup off, and they started all over. And that was just one of a number of things that didn't quite go according to plan. (laughs) That's the way it is with most weddings. There's usually something that doesn't go quite perfectly. But this had to go perfectly because these young ladies had one opportunity to make a favorable impression upon the great king, the most powerful man in the world. So 12 months of beauty treatments and training and court etiquette, and when it was all said and done, lo and behold, this obscure orphan who was raised by her older cousin Mordecai was chosen, and he loved her, and so she became the queen. She was chosen by Xerxes because of her beauty, but more fundamentally, she was chosen by God and put in place by God to save God's people from this evil empire. Nobody knew it at the time, of course. Meanwhile, older cousin Mordecai, who had raised her, 
and who obviously had access to the palace area, became aware of a plot to assassinate the king. He blew the whistle. Xerxes was saved. The bad guys were hanged. And Mordecai became a hero for a moment. And it was recorded as everything was recorded in the king's chronicles. Unfortunately for Mordecai, it was soon forgotten. But he did a good thing, and his act saved Xerxes. Xerxes was saved because of Mordecai. More fundamentally, God was also exalting Mordecai to a position of influence to help protect his people. So in chapter 3, we're introduced to a vindictive villain, to a deadly decree, and to content conspirators. We notice the vindictive villain, verse 5, but when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. Haman was second in command over all the other king's officials and all the servants in the gate, and all those servants were commanded to bow down, but Mordecai didn't do so, and it made him really mad. And as always, there's a backstory. And if you look to verse 1, you catch a clue. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite. We all read that. We paid no attention to that. Who cares? What is an Agagite anyway? Well, I'll tell you. An Agagite was a descendant of the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were the people that fought against Israel on their exodus a thousand years before. And God didn't like that one bit. And he cursed the Amalekites, and he condemned them to extinction. Exodus 17, I believe. You can check me on that. But as we know, God's patient. And so he didn't get around to carrying out the sentence for 500 years until the days of King Saul. And he commanded Saul to go take care and finish the unfinished business. And Saul went to war against uh, King Agag and all the other Agagites. And he won a very decisive victory. But he was told to kill every man and woman and child and animal and king to annihilate these people. And you may remember the story. Samuel the prophet approached him, and Samuel said, uh, Have you carried out the command? And Saul said, Oh, yes, I've done it. And Samuel uttered, the, uttered the, those famous words. He said, well, What then is this bleating of the sheep I hear in my ears, and this lowing of the oxen? And uh, Saul came close. He destroyed the uh, Agagites, but he spared the best of the livestock, and he spared King Agag. And so God rejected King Saul right then and there. And Samuel took matters into his own hands, and the text is very brutal. It says he hacked King Agag to death right there. So, although a thousand years have passed since the Exodus, and uh, 500 years since the days of King Saul hacking King, uh, prophet Samuel, hacking uh, King Agag to death, both Mordecai and Haman knew their history. And for either one to respect the other was a bridge way too far. We think sometimes that time heals all wounds. Maybe it does, but it didn't this time. And if anything, the the wound festered and it got worse and it intensified. And so we we see the secondly, the deadly decree, verse 6, but he, that is Haman, destined to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Every last one, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. And so he persuaded the king to pass a law 
Those laws were irrevocable, as you know. And they cast Lot for the date, and the date was set, and the law was passed, and the king signed it with his signet ring, and it was all established that the Jews would be history. On one day, every Jew destroyed. If you're like me, you say to yourself, you know, I would have expected Haman to wreak vengeance on Mordecai. But that wasn't enough. This man was mean. This man was bloodthirsty for revenge. He didn't want to destroy Mordecai. He wanted to destroy every Jew. And if you notice the language down here in verse 13, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate. <laughs> How many times does it need to be said to destroy, to kill, to annihilate? Men, women, children, every Jew on one day. Now, Haman was shrewd enough not to tell the king the whole story. He spun the story in economic terms. He told the king nothing of the ancient hostility. He just said, King, there's a, there's a strange group of people in your empire, and uh, they've got strange laws, and they don't follow your laws, and it's not to your profit to have these people around. You remember, it's the economy stupid, right? He didn't dare call the king stupid. He was smarter than that. But that's, it was an economic argument. Furthermore, I'll personally pay 10,000 talents of silver to you, and then think about all the spoil, all the booty that will be yours. And the king liked that. And the king said, well, do with them as you please. And so the edict went out. By Pony Express, it went out. And it went out, if I'm reading this correctly, on the 13th day of the first month, which meant that it would have been delivered on the 14th day of the first month, which was Passover. And Passover was supposed to be a great day, a great celebration, remembering God's redemptive work in history when the angel of death passed over his people and set them on their way to freedom from Egypt. So the vindictive villain succeeded in persuading the king to issue this deadly decree. And a third thing we see here is this, this picture of these two content conspirators. Verse 15, the couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. <laughs> but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Haman and Xerxes fiddled while Susa burned, <laughs> we might say. While the Jews gnashed their teeth and tore their clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and wailed and lamented, and while the whole city was thrown into confusion, Haman's heart swelled with pride at, at the, what he was about to accomplish. And Xerxes' heart was filled with excitement as he thought about the economic windfall that he would soon receive. Oh, and by the way, in verse 14, where all the peoples are told to be ready, those two words carry with it the connotation that they were not to provide any assistance to the Jewish people. Just in case there might be some sympathetic person in the empire that wanted to shelter the Jewish people, no, the Jews were on their own. They were alone against the evil empire. Last uh, Saturday evening uh, after our son's uh, wedding, we had a, the bride's family had a, not a reception in the true sense of the word, but a dinner party for the wedding party at the city club downtown. It's a very nice uh, 
arrangement, and we had a wonderful time, as you would expect. But I learned a couple of things. I learned that young people like loud music, <laughs> real loud, and they don't mind a bit shouting at each other across the table <laughs> while the music plays on. And furthermore, if you think it's too loud, it's because you're too old. <laughs> There's some expression about that. Uh, Rachel could help me remember it, but uh, if the music's too loud, you're too old. I think that's the way it, it uh, goes. So uh, I always thought it took longer to get older. <laughs> Did you think that too? Yeah. It happened so fast. But now I'm too old for, for loud music. Second thing I learned is that at 11 p.m. downtown Nashville's one big party. I'm never down there on the weekends. But we parked in the wrong garage. We do that a lot. Not a lot because we're not down there, but, but the reason we park in the wrong, we don't, we don't know our way around down there, so we parked in the wrong garage and you know, when it's your child's getting married, you have to stay to the end. And since we uh, were in the wrong garage, we had, to, we had to walk to the proper garage. So there we are at 11 p.m., walking down, I believe it was 4th Avenue, Kristen in this beautiful long dress, and me in a tuxedo, and we're carrying these beautiful flowers. <laughs> and we got the horns were honking at us, and people were yelling at us, and uh, <laughs> telling us all sorts of things, mostly good, I'm happy to say. Um, I couldn't wait to go to bed, get home, go to bed. But let me tell you, the city is just coming to life at 11 p.m. And the goal is obvious, you know, live it up. Have a great time. Don't be concerned with the problems of the world. Because we'd had a party too, so I can't be critical. But I'll say this. I don't think anybody's worried about a virus. <laughs> Nor do I think anybody really had, and this is just my assumption, I don't think anybody had any thoughts of going to church Sunday morning. I'm sorry to say. Well, in some sense, so with Haman and Xerxes, just eating and drinking and being merry with no thought to the confusion and consternation and grief and terror that they had inflicted on others. Haman, a shrewd, vindictive villain. Xerxes, a lazy king who didn't bother to do his homework and find out the real story of what was really going on. And so, while others suffered, they partied, just the two of them. Now, you know, the preacher's job is to preach good news. Good news, right? That's the gospel. So where's the good news? I almost wrote you an email this week, said, would you please find me some good news in this chapter? I need your help. You see good news anywhere? You see God anywhere? And you see why I say this book's more relevant than we think? Don't we live a lot of our days that way? Oh, I didn't hear any good news today. I heard a lot of bad news. I didn't see any good news. I didn't see God anywhere today or yesterday or the day before. I sure wish he'd show up and straighten out this world and straighten out this country and straighten out those people, straighten out that politician. Where is he? And so often we look at life this way, we draw precisely the wrong conclusions. We say, God's losing. Come on, God, we want you to win, but you're losing. And the gospel is powerless and the church is inept. And C.S. Lewis has a word for us. He says, we misread the signs. I mean, who would, have, who would have read chapter one and looked at a drunk king and said, wow, look how God's at work there. <laughs> or chapter two, uh, international beauty pageant. 
God's up to something. <laughs> Can't you tell? God's up to something. Or uh, forgotten Mordecai. Well, where's God? Mordecai's supposed to get some reward, some recognition. Or when Esther went in to be with the queen, uh, with the king for her one night stand, would any of us have said, oh, our salvation is at stake here. Sure hope this works out. God, I sure hope you're at work. So easy to misread the signs, isn't it? Point is, Esther chapter 3 is not the last chapter. There's more to come. Remember the old parable about the uh, little boy, young boy, young teenager, I think it was, that got a pony? And all the villagers said, that's good. But the wise man said, we'll see. Sometime later, he fell off the pony and broke his leg. And all the villagers said, that's bad. But the wise man said, we'll see. And sometime later, war broke out, and all the young men had to go off and fight in the war. But this young man didn't have to go because of his injury. And all the villagers said, that's good. But the wise man said what? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see God at work. We'll see how all this shakes out. And I'll give you a little hint. What we'll see is what we sang in our opening hymn today and what we read in Psalm 76, that even the wrath of man will praise God. Amen. Or... As we sang last week, I would have used the hymn today, but he stole it from me last week. <laughs> Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace because behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face amen father we do thank you for your smiling face and we ask your forgiveness for the many times we misread the signs we get so pessimistic and so discouraged we rejoice that you are on the throne that our God reigns that the nations may rage and the the kings of the earth may take their stand against you, but you laugh. You laugh. And so we worship you, and we trust you, and we thank you that we already know the outcome. We, we, know, we know the end of the story. And so we thank you for the strength that we have for today and bright hope for tomorrow through Christ, our blessed Redeemer. In whose name we pray. Amen.